Hi, I'm Brady Gaster, and I am a uh, PM on the Azure Tools crew um, with uh, Visual Studio. So my job is to make it easier for you to build .NET applications using Visual Studio or .NET Aspire uh, with Visual Studio so that you can party in the cloud. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a couple of uh, small agenda items. Uh, the first one is kind of going to be a refresh into how you would get started in VS with a brand new Aspire uh, distributed app. Uh, and then I'm going to show you kind of how you would do that at piecemeal uh, using some of our tools and to add Aspire integrations or as they're formerly known components. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to show you is how you could bring an existing uh, kind of a simple web application, uh, kind of your traditional two-tier uh, ASP.NET Core plus SQL uh, application, say running on app service where you've already got like a deployed environment set up. Um, how and you want to use Aspire to kind of you know develop locally and you get the benefits of the dashboard when you're trying things out. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into Visual Studio and we we'll get started. So you'll see here that I've got Visual Studio open. I'm going to zoom in on certain dialogues uh, from time to time because uh, I've got my resolution set as big as it'll still fit everything, uh, but still there's a couple of dialogues that are small. I'll do my best to zoom in from time to time. Uh, with that handy tool, zoom it. So the first thing I'll do is I'll select new uh, project. And I'm going to start with an Aspire starter app. Now we have a couple of other templates in here, like uh, .NET Aspire empty. And we've also got .NET Aspire templates for the startup, for the uh, app host project, and for the service uh, defaults project. Uh, I'll show you those in a moment. But what we'll start with now is that Aspire starter app. I'll click next here. I'm just going to call it Aspire app 3, put that in my source folder. Click Next, and I'm going to go ahead and turn on Configure HTTPS because security. I'm going to turn on Redis, and I'm actually going to create a test project uh, using MS Test. I'm going to go ahead and hit Create right here. And what you'll see now is that the package is going to open up. I've got a couple of uh, internal builds, so I've got a couple of new packages coming in. Uh, you'll see that the Aspire project is going to open up and kind of get me ready. Just so kind of explore all the parts. Here's my app host. You'll see that a lot today. It's just kind of a one-stop shop for your entire Aspire application. I've got this API service backend. I've got this uh, web front end, which I'll leave open here. And then I've also got a tests project. Now this test project, what it'll give me the capability to do is actually use the Visual Studio test uh, features or the VS Code test features. I can actually run this test and it will fire up the Aspire runtime and hit individual endpoints in my runtime and make sure the uh, individual services are up. I'll close that test project down. And uh, at this point, what I'll do next is I'm going to show you kind of how the, the integrations work, how Aspire integrations work. Now, I've got an integration that I need to add to this front end. I'm actually going to, oh, should I do it to the back end? I'm going to add uh, SQL to the back end. You'll see me do this a little bit later on, but I'm going to right click on this dependencies node. I'm going to zoom in so you see that we've got this add.NET Aspire package, a node right here that's along with your NuGet packages and other other dependencies. I'll right click on that again and just say add .NET Aspire package. And since I'm in that API service, it's going to show me a list of client packages that I might need to use in my app. I'm going to use this Aspire RabbitMQ client uh, package. I'll go ahead and click on install here. That will install the, uh, the uh, RabbitMQ stuff into my API service project. And I'm going to close this down and go to the front end, or actually to the uh, app host here, and right click on dependencies. Once again, selecting this add.NET Aspire package, and you'll see a slight difference when it opens up, and that's that this will be filtered for hosting. The reason for that is earlier I selected a traditional web or API project inside of Visual Studio and said I wanted the.NET Aspire package. So Visual Studio knows that what I really want is one of those client packages so that my app code can actually make use of that service. Now when I do this in the app host, knows that instead what I'm going to need is a hosting package to kind of enable that hosting capability inside of Aspire. I'm going to want the RabbitMQ host, so I'll go ahead and click Install. Now, the idea here is that I've just installed the RabbitMQ hosting package into my app host project, and I've installed the RabbitMQ client package into my uh, backend uh, client project. Now, at this point, I would kind of do var rabbit uh, and RabbitMQ, and I would say builder dot uh, add rabbit in queue, how we give it a name, and we just go from there. And at this point, what it's going to do is that would come that would come in 
as a uh, as a uh, container. It would be running when I hit F5 inside of my uh, dashboard. Go ahead to show you that. I'll just click Run right here. And what we do is we pre-wire all Aspire starter projects such that the app host is the startup point. And the app host will essentially know how to start all of those other projects and set all those references around uh, individually. So you'll see here that I've already launched my browser window open, hide my bookmarks so we don't have any distractions. We'll pull this in and you'll see here's everything. Now this one will be starting. That means it's actually pulling down that RabbitMQ uh, image from uh, Docker. Uh, and you'll see now that that is running. I've got the API service here in the web front end. If I wanted to actually try these out, I could click on that web front end. You can see here that here's my counter. And if I hit weather, you'll see that that's going to be a cached response. It's actually going to put the uh, response of the API directly in the Redis. And if I were to go over here and look at traces, uh, you'll see the dashboard a bunch today. So I won't explore it too much, but you can see how that traversal is happening. You make a call at the front end. Front end makes a call to cache, and the back end so That's kind of how we, we had everything going. So that's kind of your file new experience if you haven't worked with Aspire yet and you kind of want to get up and running with it. Uh, one thing I do want to show you, however, is if you want to kind of onesie twosie this, like you know that you're going to need some back end resources. Uh, so you want to kind of start with your app host and you know you might need a couple of other nodes, but you kind of want to go one at a time uh, for you know whatever reason you're going to be adding these individually. So I'm going to kind of walk through that process real quick. So first thing I'll do is just say file, we're going to start over. New project, and this time I'm going to pick empty uh, .NET Aspire empty app. And what that, all that's going to do is that's going to drop in that app host project. Let's say Aspire empty app. That's going to essentially drop in that app host project and the service defaults project, and then not not do anything else. If I wanted to add anything to this project, I would essentially right click my uh, project, I would uh, my solution. I'll go here, add new project. I would pick Blazor Web App. I would just leave that web, web front end. We go. I'll click Next. Now, this step is great. It sees that I've already got an Aspire solution directly inside of Visual Studio. So what it's going to do is it's going to show me this Enlist in .NET Aspire Orchestration checkbox, which will essentially be a one-click way for me to bootstrap that web application that I just added to my Aspire project, really my only client project in the Aspire solution, directly to my app OCS. And you can see here that we go ahead and drop in the line of code. And if I wanted to right now, I could just hit F5. And what should happen is that that, that dashboard will open up again, and we will see that web front end as the only resource in the Aspire app. See here it's spinning up. There we go. Right here, I'll just click uh, the front end, and now we're good. That's all hot. So that kind of shows you how you can really go piecemeal. You know, you just want to get started with an empty app and kind of move on from there. Okay, so this is the part that I'm really excited to show everybody. We've had a lot of questions from folks around uh, uh, how to kind of do like dev provisioning uh, from within your Aspire app. So I might have some sort of a resource that I can only, you know, party on when it's actually a deployed resource. A good example of that would be uh, Azure Open AI. So what I'll do now is I'll right-click my dependencies node for my app host, and I'm actually not going to write any code to make use of that Azure OpenAI uh, resource. I've got some code that I'll show you here in a moment that will do that for you, uh, or a sample for you. But I want to click uh, .NET Aspire uh, package here in my app host project, because what I want is the OpenAI or Cognitive Services hosting pack. I'll do a search here for hosting for OpenAI. Here's my Aspire hosting Azure Cognitive Services uh, package. I'll go ahead and click Install here, and I will get that uh, uh, OpenAI stuff to embedded into my app host. And now I'm going to need to write a little bit of code. So I can't remember from time to time how to do some of these individual little you know playground-y kinds of uh, uh, things. So what's really good is that in the Aspire repository, uh, we have this folder right here called Playground. You'll see that I've github.com uh, forward slash, excuse me, github.com forward slash dot net uh, forward slash aspire right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and click on Playground. And the Playground project that I want is this OpenAI end-to-end. -end. You can see we've got Oracle end-to-end, -end, parameterized uh, stuff end-to-end, -end, uh, the Postgres end-to-end, et -end, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but today what I want to look at is this OpenAI end-to-end -end because I know 
uh, Sebastian and Mitch have some really easy to copy code in here that I can party on. So I'll go in here to this app host. Mm -hmm. I want to go to that app host's program CS. I'm just going to copy this code right here and I'll walk through what that code does when we get back into our favorite product, Visual Studio. So I've just put a couple of new lines here. And what you're going to see is I've got this deployment model name. I'm not going to be using that anywhere else in my code, so I could just drop it in right here, but I'm not going to do that. I'll walk through what the code does. This line right here, add Azure OpenAI, will basically create a new Azure OpenAI resource out in my Azure subscription for me. Then it will add a deployment. The deployment that I want is the GPT-40 uh, deployment, uh, the new one. Uh, so I'm going to party on that in my application later once I have a little bit more time to write more code uh, outside the demo uh, world. Um, so what I'll do next is open up my timer to make sure I'm not going over. And then I will come over here. I'm just going to hit F5. I'm not going to begin. I'm not going to add any code. And that will open the app up in the dashboard one more time. But this time we're going to see an error. I'm going to walk through what that error looks like for you. So what you'll see here in the dashboard is that we have this error that says missing subscription configuration. And if I were to scroll over here to logs and click on logs, zoom on this, it's going to say resource could not be provisioned because Azure subscription, location, and resource group information is missing. And then here's a link where you can learn how to do it that goes out to our docs and kind of teaches you what you need to do here. I'm going to show you a nifty feature we've got inside of VS to kind of make it automatic for you. Uh, essentially, what we've got is this feature we're uh, calling uh, Azure Auto Provisioning. Now, for me, I've got an Azure subscription that I party on, uh, log into it with my personal sub, uh, I pay for it myself, et cetera, et cetera. So I am an owner of that sub, both from the perspective of logging into the, VS and from the portal and the CLI. I can do anything with that sub. Not everybody's in that situation, but if you have your own you know, test sub where you can kind of create resources and kind of go fast, this is a really great feature for you. Um, if you're in an environment where your Azure subs are locked down, it might be a little bit more complicated, uh, but you can get your admins to kind of set you up with you know access to one resource group or whatever, so you can kind of do what you're going to see me do right now. So what I'll do is I'll uh, right-click on connected services inside of that app host project explicitly. This will only work in the app host project because that's kind of your host for all of your stuff. It sends all the variables in to all the other projects. You'll see that I've got this Azure resource provisioning settings uh, option right here. I'm going to click that again. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask me for the subscription that I want to party on, uh, the location that I want to party in. So I'm going to say East U.S., then the resource group that I want, I want to create a new one. So I'll call this Brady G Dev 01, because uh, I'll probably create a few of these. And I'll click OK, and then I'll click OK one more time. And it's going to go out to the Azure Fabric, create that resource group for me. And now when I hit F5, we should see something slightly different inside of our uh, uh, dashboard. What you'll see this time, I've configured it properly, uh, is that, let me look here. It is now going to compile that ARM template. So what's happening is Azure Auto Provisioning is now figuring out what it needs to do, uh, like what resources will need to be provisioned inside of my Azure subscription. Uh, and then it's going to go out, create that resource group, build the bicep or ARM templates that it needs to kind of deploy everything. And then it's actually going to execute that deployment directly against my Azure subscription. The idea is essentially just-in-time resources so that your application code can be written. Uh, this is really helpful for situations like OpenAI or when you need to use live resources in Azure, such as storage or Cosmos DB or something like that. You don't want to use an emulator, can't install an emulator, or it's just your team's practice to kind of use live, live resources. What you'll also see is that the, the, the resource link, as it's doing its provisioning, is a link directly into the Azure portal. So if I wanted to go into the Azure portal and actually watch that, watch that deployment take place, I could. Now I have the Azure portal open right over here. So what I'll do is I'll go into, whoops, I'll go into that dev uh, resources uh, guy that I just created. Oops, we'll do that again. I'll say that again. I'm going to close that down. So I'll start here. So you see there, now it's already running. So that means that this provisioning has already happened. And I'm going to drag in my browser window, and you'll see this is that resource group that I was talking about. And there is that OpenAI resource. If I were to click on that OpenAI resource, I could now go in and start making some tweaks to that resource 
I could look at the model deployments for it, go right here into the OpenAI Studio. You can see that it has not only created that OpenAI resource, but it's also created that GPT resource for that GPT deployment for me as well. And it did that all by me just configuring it using this, uh, whoops, this handy feature right here, Azure uh, resource provisioning settings, and then just hitting F5. Again, that's you know for folks like me who they have your own Azure subscription and you want, want to kind of get started like that. Now, the last piece that I want to show you is probably the longest demo. Um, and essentially the idea behind this is you've already got some ASP.NET code. Uh, kind of your traditional scenario is like I've got an ASP app that uses like a SQL Server backend, or Azure SQL backend uh, to, to do some simple stuff. And I've got to deploy to App Service Linux or Windows. Now there's a lot of .NET developers who are in that scenario. They, they probably already use AZD to do their deployment or they have some other CSED process that they're already running. And really what they want to be able to do is this F5 experience to be able to add integrations and kind of move fast. Um, good news is you can do that because .NET Inspire is .NET. Um, everything that you've already learned how to do with .NET, you can continue to do inside of .NET Inspire and all the deployment capabilities that you already used, you can still use. So I've got a great sample out here. Uh, it's the AZD Blazor template. Uh, written by my good friends Jason and Shane. And this is the exact topology that I'm referring to. It's essentially a Blazor, you know, front-end web app. And that Blazor front-end web app uh, gives me the capability to uh, just access uh, SQL Server. And the way it does that is using ASP.NET Identity. So that ASP.NET Identity is, is essentially a, a database of, of uh, uh, user accounts that have logged, that have created user accounts on my system and have given themselves the ability to log in uh, using that SQL Server uh, 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 process. Now, I've already got this deployed using AZD right here because, you know, that 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 AZD template made it so easy. So here you can see that I've got the SQL Server, and right there I've got the SQL Server database, and then up here I've got my app service. So everything's already deployed, and if I were to go into this app service and mm -hmm. click on Browse uh, right here, You'll see that it's going to open up. And if I were to go here to auth required, um, that's my sample user, uh, click login. And that sample user should be logged in immediately. And now I'm logged in. So you can see that this is a front end app that is uh, talking to a Azure SQL back end database. And everything is continuing to work just fine. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to open that project up in Visual Studio. And essentially, to quote my good friend Donovan, rub a little Aspire on it. Kind of want to make it easier for me to, you know, party on it locally. Um, so I want to go to File, and then I'll open Project or Solution. I'm going to go over here to my Source folder, uh, Source. I've got this AZD Blazor demo, and I've got this web project right here. So I'll just open up this web project, and can say, you know, going to have to do a couple of uh, updates on my NuGet packages first. I'll go ahead and click on Updates over here. Got a couple of NuGet packages I need to update, so I'll just click them all and update. Now you might have a few more. You might, you know, need to massage that a little bit more, but you know, I kind of want to get all my packages up to date before I start doing anything with Aspire. Uh, so at this point, you've already seen me right-click on one of these projects or on the file new experience. You've seen me use uh, add uh, project to Aspire orchestration. Good news is we've given you that capability right here on on the right-click menu as well. So I'll right click on my project. I'll go down here to .NET Aspire Orchestration. You can see that dangling off the add menu right here. And that's on any uh, web project or other projects. So I can go here to add .NET Aspire support. And I'm going to make a couple of changes here because I'm kind of persnickety about my, uh, my the way I've got my files organized. So I'll click Browse. And I'm just going to back up one folder to source because I want my uh, service defaults project and my Appos project is set in the same folder as my web project. So I'll select uh, that, and then I'll just click OK. And the final question should be, uh, now that you have a few projects in this solution, we're going to want to make a solution file. I don't want to put my solution file in web. I want to put that at that root. So I'll back up to source, and I'll hit save, and then there we go. So now we have this uh, solution set up. You can see that I've still got my web project right here. And I've still got my Appos project. Right here. I've got a new Appos project here. And then I've got this service defaults project here. Now, 
going to have to make a couple of code changes in the web post project because we need to support, you know, SQL and a new framework. I were to open up the program CS for my back end project, for my front end project, you'll see that right here, we're getting the connection string from Key Vault. And you can see that I'm just calling it default connection and I'm using the application DB context, which is the uh, entity framework database context that you get with a ASP.NET Core identity. So that gives me the, all the users and roles and everything else I need to be able to do in that SQL database just automatically. Uh, so what I can do now is I can right click on that uh, app host project right here and I'm going to say add.net aspire package. So my, you've done this already. Dad.net Aspire package, and I want to do SQL serve, uh, Azure SQL. So I'll type SQL right here. And all I need in my Appos project is this Aspire.hosting.sql server package. So I'll go ahead and click install. That's going to install that into my app host. And now I'm going to go over here to my web project and kind of do the same thing. I'll right click on dependencies and I'll hit add.net Aspire package. And real quick, what I want to show you here. Uh, you'll see that it didn't load. Uh, again, I'm using an internal build, and in this build, for whatever reason, when I sometimes when I do that second uh, right-click uh, add Aspire uh, package, it like doesn't it doesn't register for some reason. So the way you can work around that until we fix it is you can right-click your project and you can go unload project, and then you can right-click that project again and say reload project. And I had that program CS open, so I'll go ahead and open that back up. And now I can right-click dependencies and I can say add .NET Inspire package and the dialog will pop open. So sorry about that, working on it, trying to get that one resolved before we ship. So I'll go ahead and type SQL one more time. And remember, since I'm using the application DB context object inside of that web project, since I'm using ASP.NET identity, I'm already using Entity Framework and clearly I'm already using SQL Server. So on my web project, I'm just gonna do aspire.microsoft.entityframework.core.sql server. I'm going to install that into my web project and click I accept. Now, as mentioned, there's a little bit of code we're going to need to write both in the Appos project and in my web project. Uh, so I'm going to walk through that now. First one is going to be the Appos. So we're going to need to create a SQL server and a SQL server database. So I'll go right here because we know that the name of the connection to that database and the front end code is default connection. I'm just going to copy that. And we'll say var SQL server is equal to builder dot add SQL server. And we'll just call it SQL server. And then you do that. And that lays down essentially a reference to a SQL server. Uh, at this point, the Appos would pull down the SQL server container and run that directly on my machine. Uh, but I'm going to need a database in that SQL server. So what I'll do now is I'll say var on a SQL DB is equal to SQL server dot add database and we'll paste in default connection right there. Now I want to reference that database from my web project. My web project's going to use it. So I'll just say uh, with reference and we'll pass it SQL DB. And what that essentially will do is uh, create the database server and create the database inside of that database server, get the connection string for that uh, database and then inject it directly into my web project. So I can just run, everything will work. But there's one final step, and that step is that I need to enrich the code that I've already written. So the idea behind enrichment is that I've already got this application DB context, and I've already got a connection string that I'm either reading from configuration or hopefully from Key Vault in the deployed situation, or I'm using managed identity to uh, directly access that database with my logged in credentials. Um, but I don't have any of the Aspire goodness yet inside of that uh, uh, application DB context. So I want to enrich it. There's one line of code that I would need to have to be able to do that. I'll go right here and I'll just type builder. And we'll say enrich, enrich SQL Server DB context. Click that here. And I just want to pass in this application DB context as the parameter. And I don't need to customize that all. I can just leave that alone. So again, just to kind of reflect on what we've done, we have installed the SQL Server hosting package into our Appos project, and then we wrote a couple lines of code to create a SQL Server and a SQL Server database in it. And then we referenced that SQL uh, Server database from our web project. Then we add the, uh, let me make sure I get the right name for you. We do the Microsoft, uh, do the Aspire, .microsoft .entity framework core .sql Server. 
package, we install that into the actual web project that you brought to the party. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you go into its program CS and you enrich that application DB context. If you mouse over that enrich method, what you'll see, if we get the IntelliSense, is it going to give me the IntelliSense? Am I going to IntelliSense? No, it's not going to give me IntelliSense. Yes, because I'm presenting. Uh, it essentially would show you that it's going to add health checks, uh, retries, telemetry, and all the good stuff that you love with this fire and inject all the connection strings and variables in the right place. So at this point, pretty much ready to go. So I'll go ahead up here and I'll click the uh, start on my debugger. That will open up in the uh, dashboard one more time. Here's my console window running. And here comes the dashboard. And you can see now we've got that SQL server, uh, uh, the actual machine in the form of a, of a container running. Here's my uh, SQL server uh, database resource, which we've named default connection. It's basically the name of the connection string to it. And then there's my front end. So let me click the front end. Looks like it's working. I'll go over here to register and just uh, create sample at user.com, give it a super complicated password. And I'll click register. And then I'm going to go through this process. Uh, I actually read these docs to figure out how to send an email to actually show somebody how to confirm their account. We don't need to do that right now because we're in dev. I'll just go ahead and confirm that account. And now I'll go to auth required and I'll log in with that same account. And now I'm authenticated. If I go here to sample at user.com, you can see that we're authenticated. So this is the user experience indicating that this front end web app is successfully talking to that uh, SQL resource in the back end, back end being right here on my machine. But if I were to click on the logs view for that uh, front end web application, you'll see all of the any framework logging happening showing all those SQL commands back and forth to the database, showing that everything is indeed working. If I were to get here to traces, uh, you would see that those calls are getting made back to the database as well. So that's all good. Uh, we're actually, everything seems to be working fine. And at this point, the, you know, the true test is going to be uh, for me to uh, open up a console window and to CD into that directory, uh, AZB, AZB Blazor, I'll just go here and I'll just say AZD um, list just to make sure we've got all those environments. And the one that I've got active is that one right there. I don't want that one active. I want this one active because it's the one that we have deployed in my Azure subscription uh, right here. Um, this is the one that we have deployed right here. <laughs> so what I'll do now is I will say AZD um, um, I forgot the sets, sets, and I will copy this one paste it here and then I can essentially do AZD up boom. and what you'll see it do is it's going to spin up that AZD process now I've already got this set up in my sub so it's I'm just going to go ahead and use all the existing stuff that I've already got uh, it should not say you've got a new Aspire app it should just go ahead and deploy it for me uh, for some reason I didn't select the existing uh, environment that I already had all oh, right, I accidentally deleted that environment or whatever, but you can see what it's doing now is it's not doing the essentially easy way of packaging everything up and presuming that it wants to go to ACA, the container apps. It's actually using the AZD template that I pulled down that basically deploys everything up to uh, app service uh, with SQL Server and Key Vault. So it didn't change anything about the deployment. I didn't have to change anything about the code, say one line where I enriched the, the DD context. And essentially, I can continue to use what I was already using. The reason I wanted to show you this is we've had a lot of customers say it looks like I have to kind of enlist with everything that Aspire gives me. It's like an all or nothing. It's not. .NET Aspire is .NET. If you already have something you're doing, you can keep doing that. Uh, there might be a couple of things you need to do manually, such as if I wanted to go in and add an API back end, this web project front end. Uh, it's not going to automatically wire everything up for me inside of app service. I would have to do that manually. I'm already doing that manually, so it's not like my life's going to get any harder, but my development stuff is going to be easier when I'm f 5 and trying to code out on my machine because I'm using .NET Aspire. So the idea behind this is you take your existing code, rub a little Aspire on it. Thank you, Donovan. And now you can just kind of, you know, party locally as easy as you can in the cloud. And as you saw with our auto provisioning, if you need to party in the cloud right away, right off the bat, you can do that as well as long as you aren't under it yourself. All further ado, I want to say goodbye. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about all the good stuff we're doing with .NET Inspire. Please enjoy the rest of the speakers, ask questions, leave comments, and file issues. That's how the product gets better. Thanks a lot. Happy coding.